Epigastric pain is often non-infectious in, in etiology. It may be an initial manifestation of appendicitis, however, and also is common with pancreatitis, which in fulminant cases will lead to pancreatic abscess or infected pseudocyst. In the case of pancreatitis, they will present with abdominal tenderness, and when infected, usually these are fulminant cases with severe third spacing, potentially hypoxia, and signs of sepsis. The microbiology of infected pancreas is similar to that of infected gallbladder that includes all of the same pathogens. And the treatment is traditionally a beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor, although carbipenems have been used more commonly for no particular reason. As with the other intra-abdominal pathogens, the penallergic host can be treated with fluoroquinolones and metronidazole, but because Canada it may be part of the differential, you may also include fluconazole. Epigastric pain may also present due to peptic ulcer disease, which is an infection due to H. pylori in many cases. The risk factors include alcohol, non anti-inflammatory, and the signs and symptoms are dyspepsia. The treatment of H. pylori is with clarithromycin, amoxicillin, and a proton pump inhibitor. Suprapubic pain may be due to pelvic inflammatory disease centered in the cervix as opposed to the fallopian tubes, which may extend into the endometrium. Also, urinary tract infections such as cystitis or prostatitis might present with suprapubic pain. In the case of pelvic inflammatory disease, as opposed to salpingitis or tubo ovarian abscess, the pelvic pain is central and is, as with the previous infections, often a new sexual partner might be identified. Pain typically radiates to the back, and on physical exam, you can elicit cervical motion tenderness, which is a key physical finding to establish that diagnosis in association with cervical discharge. As with salpingitis and tubo ovarian abscess, it's critical to identify gonococcus, which can be easily identified using PCR probes of the cervix, and treatment for gonorrhea with ceftriaxone is the drug of choice. In the absence of gonococcus, cefoxetin, cefotetan, plus doxycycline are appropriate. In the case of cystitis, this is a lower urinary tract infection, manifest as frequency and burning, usually caused by enterobacteriaceae and the coagulase negative staph saprophyticus, and this may be treated with Bactrim or first-generation cephalosporin. Prostatitis usually is an uncommon manifestation of suprapubic pain, but occurs in typically older men with signs and symptoms of prostatism, including urine hesitancy, nocturia, reduced urinary stream, caused by enterobacteriaceae and enterococcus, and treated with drugs that uniquely penetrate the prostate, which would be trimethoprim sulfur or fluoroquinolones. Finally, generalized abdominal pain may be caused by a variety of infectious and non-infectious pathogens. Most important among these would be those causing peritonitis. Also consider pyelonephritis. Abdominal pain can be a manifestation of systemic sepsis, or metabolic disorders, including diabetes, porphyria, toxic shock syndrome, typhoid fever, and non-infectious diseases such as familial Mediterranean fever, polyarteritis nodosum. Finally, vascular causes of abdominal pain, such as dissecting aortic aneurysm or mesenteric ischemia. In the case of peritonitis, we break that down as primary so-called spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, which occurs in individuals with cirrhosis or nephrotic syndrome. The abdominal pain is generally nonspecific, and there might not be fever. The diagnosis is established by a paracentesis in which greater than 200 neutrophils are found in the fluid. Usually, there is no pathogen identified, but when a bacteria grows, it's usually a single organism that is usually an aerobic pathogen. A polymicrobial infection implies secondary peritonitis, which is usually due to an intra-abdominal perforation 
from such things as appendicitis, diverticulitis, or pelvic inflammatory disease. There are specific peritonitis in addition to consider. People with end-stage kidney disease receiving peritoneal dialysis are particularly susceptible to peritonitis associated with infected catheters, and tuberculosis may similarly present as peritonitis. The treatment of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is traditionally with ceftriaxone or carbipenem or fluoroquinolone plus metronidazole in the penicillin allergic patient. The critical importance of peritonitis is to distinguish primary versus secondary peritonitis so as to recognize undiagnosed intestinal perforations. In the case of pyelonephritis, it is essential to distinguish that from other causes of abdominal pain. So the diagnosis of intra-abdominal infections depends on recognition of a broad number of infectious and non-infectious syndromes that may present with abdominal pain. It's essential for the clinician to be familiar with the distinct abdominal pain syndromes, and it is useful to break those down according to the quadrants and localization that I presented to recognize those things which may be referred pain, as in the case of pneumonia or pleuridinia, those cases that are non-infectious and vascular, as in with a dissecting aneurysm or a ectopic pregnancy. Recognizing the diverse causes of Abdominal pain is essential in surgery and internal medicine.